Before Jeremy goes in search of his personal fortune, he needs to know if there is one left to find. That means working out when and how the Kilners went under. It's a long shot, but one possible explanation is a court case hinted at in the Kilner brochure. Well, it seems that I've got to go to some kind of records place in Huddersfield to find out what this court case is all about. Because there is still this question of how this enormous company came to flounder. Um, and maybe we'll get to the end of the trail and someone will have put a little note saying treasure marked with an X and they buried all the money in a garden, so I don't know. Records still exist for most 19th century court cases. Victorian legal documents may be complicated and wordy, but they can also be full of surprises. That was a fascinating two hours. <laughs> it was amazing because the court case, it was environmental, which, must, which was unheard of, I would imagine, back then. What happened was, is all that countryside around um, the plant, around the factory at Thornhill Lees, belonged to the estate of the Earl of Scarborough. And they argued that their trees were dying and their crops were being killed by the smoke. The photograph you showed me, this one, by the smoke coming out of the chimneys. And this was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because Kilmers couldn't turn the furnaces off. And so it went to court. And the judge made a decision, which we ought to check his lines, actually, and see if he's produced Jonathan Porritt, because the judge said, yeah, it's a nuisance. And I made a note of his line, no man has the right to interfere with the supply of pure air. I mean, this is the dawn of Greenpeace, if you like. Three quarters of the population of Thornhill Lees worked to kill us. Three quarters. So they all wrote saying, we will all lose our jobs. And they were told to bugger off, basically. I mean, this is, the, this is always the problem with environmentalism. However it's wrapped up, it's not based with any, in any sense of reality. No, throw 400 people away, not interested in them and hand over the world's glassmaking to the French and the Americans. But look at this beech tree. See how healthy it is. Um, the upshot was they were given three months to buy at a cost of £1,500 each six gas furnaces. £1,500 in 1871. I've had a thought. This trip to Huddersfield is where I get, I was taught me where I get my, <clears throat> excuse me, deep-seated loathing for environmentalists from. I mean, look at this square, look. Look around, okay, the hotel, the municipal buildings, look at that for a railway station, look at that. And all of it was paid for by factories that make smoke. Huddersfield's front room, paid for by smoke. He'd understand. Harold, he knew. The Kilners had survived their court case, but the next challenge they faced was mechanization. In the early 20th century, a new machine from America called the Owens began to replace traditional glass blowing. The Kilners had been forced to buy gas furnaces but would they choose to invest in expensive new machinery? Glass manufacturer Alastair Rattray has found something in the company archives. Whilst we've been on our little tour, we've been able to look this out, uh, which, interestingly enough, does mention the, the Kilner's people and... Um, the Owen bottle-making machine? That is the Owen bottle machine. But this is the American one we were talking about. This is the about. one that came in in about 1907 or so, and it was the first really big high productivity machine. This is, this is when we moved to 40 bottles a minute, which in those days, that was supersonic. 
Well, if you look here, mm -hmm. by 1907, the first impact of a truly automatic machine was felt yeah. throughout the industry, and that year, Kilners at Thornhill Lees introduced the Owen. Mm. So they were quite fast off the mark mm. oh, in yes, getting one of these yeah. machines. Still unclear about the fate of the glassworks, Jeremy heads for the one important place left on the Kilner map, Connersborough. But en route, he decides to take a quick detour. This is Tickhill. This is where all everyone on my dad's side, all of them, were born and brought up right back to the 18th century and half the people on my mum's side. 